Hello. Okay, let's get started. Um, I'm Allison. I'm a mentor with CSM, and today is session two of CSM Final Review. So today we'll be covering post midterm two material as well as balanced trees. Um, this includes stacks, queues, graphs, shortest paths, MSTs, sorting, and tries. So just to recap a little bit from yesterday, a binary search tree is a tree that um, we basically just determine some sort of order for our nodes. So for example, um, on this tree to the right, three is our node, our root node, and to the left we put one because one is smaller than three, and to the right we put five because five is greater than three. If you just walked in, uh, these slides are all posted on Piazza. Uh, yeah, and the average runtime of a BST is log n, and that's the case where uh, each node generally has two children. So uh, the reason why it's log n is because the height of our tree is that uh, average case log n. So what happens when our BST isn't balanced? So to the right we have an example of that where our BST actually just looks like a linked list um, and that's just because of the node that we chose to be our root which is actually the smallest value in our tree. So the worst case runtime for a BST is linear time. So how do we make this runtime better? And this is where balanced trees come in. So a balanced tree is just a tree in which uh, we're basically forcing our height to be log n. So how do we do that? The first um, example of this is a 2-3 tree. So this is a binary search tree where each node can only have two or three children. Uh, so let's walk through a quick example. So to the right we have a 2-3 tree and we're going to insert 6. So we look at the root node, we see that 6 is larger than 3 but smaller than 7. So we're going to go into this uh, center node and add six. And we know that this is valid because uh, each node can have one or two elements. So next we're going to insert 11. We check the root node, we see that 11 is greater than seven. So we're going to go to this node to the right and put 11 there. But now we have a problem because uh, we know that each node can only have one or two children. We have three children in this node. So what we're going to do is uh, split this node and push that 10 up to the root, like so. Now we have another problem, right? So now the root has three nodes, and we know that uh, each node can only have, sorry, the root has three elements, and each node can only have two elements. So what we're going to do is split the root, push that 7 up, and now we have a valid 2, 3 tree. So the main reason why trees like this are balanced is because we're only creating new nodes when we uh, split our old nodes. Any questions on two, three trees? Yes. Could you repeat that? Um, you, you always generally pick the middle element to push up. Um, if we go back, if we chose that 11 to push up, then we would end up with um, like a two-element two node in the bottom, but what we want to do is split those evenly. Any other questions? Cool, so let's talk about left-leaning red-black trees. So LLRBs are exactly the same as a 2-3 tree, they're just a slightly different representation. So what we're going to do is a short example where we uh, convert this 2, 3 tree into a red, black tree. So how do we represent the 2, 3 tree as an LLRB? What we're going to do is we're going to choose a node and um, so let's just look at the solution. So we're choosing this 7 to uh, act as our top node and we're moving our 3 down and creating a red edge right here. So the reason why we're putting our edge to the left is because it's a left-leaning red, black tree. Um, there's also such thing as like a right-leaning red-black tree where we would actually choose the three as the root node, um, but 
just for convention, we're always going to have our red links to the left. <clears throat> uh, and to convert back into a 2-3 tree from an LLRB, what we're actually going to do is that uh, if a node has a red edge under it, it's going to absorb that red edge and create a larger node, like so. So the average and worst case runtime for 2-3 trees and LLRBs is log n, and that's because we're fixing our height to always be log n. Any questions before we jump into our first example? Cool. I'll give maybe two or three minutes to work on this. Uh, and if you just came in, all these slides are posted on the piazza, and there are also cookies up at the front if you get hungry. Okay. <laughs> Tell her I love her. That you love her? Yes. yes. Can I take one for my Yeah, sure. Sweet. Did not offer me. <laughs> Cool, so let's go over the solution together. Uh, let's raise our hand if we think the answer is true. How about uh, if we think the answer is false? Correct, so the answer is false, and let's uh, step through an example for why that's so. So to the left, we're going to have a red, black, sorry, a two, three tree, where we're inserting in the order one, two, three, four, five. To the right, we're gonna insert two, three, four, five, and one. So inserting two and three, inserting three and four, and here we're going to split the node because we have three elements. And then we're going to add four and five, five and one. So now we already see that it has to be different because we have to split the left side and we don't have to split the right side, but yeah, let's move that four up. And we can see that the solution is false because the trees are, uh, they have a different structure. Any questions on this practice question A? Cool. Let's move on. Um, I'll give maybe five minutes for this question.
Cool. Let's go over this question together. Um, so whenever you see a question that's asking you to add a value into an LLRB, um, generally you just want to first convert it into a 2-3 tree, make any insertions uh, that you need, and then convert it back into an LLRB. And we can do that because we know that um, all operations do the same thing on trees that are uh, equivalent. So first we're going to convert it into a 2-3 tree. Here all I'm doing is uh, we see that this 3 has a red edge under it, so we're going to absorb this 1 into this node. Same thing with the 10 and the 8. Next we're going to add 9, um, and we, we're going to start from the root. We see that 9 is greater than 7, so 9 is going to go into this node. And now we see that we have to split this node. So what we're going to do is push 9 up into the root, and then we can convert back to an LORB. Any questions? Okay, next is queues and stacks. Hello. Can you guys hear me? Can you guys in the back raise your hand if you can hear me? Woo. Um, so we're going to go and learn about stacks and queues today. Uh, can you guys first high five the person next to you? Just, just cause. No? There you go, all nice and cozy. Um, so we got stacks and queues. Okay, sorry. We have stacks and queues. Um, so a queue is first in, first out. Acronym is Philo. Basically, that means that um, if I put in, let's say, ABC, the first thing that will come out will be A. Um, stacks are the opposite, first in, last out. Um, that's Philo. The first one is FIFO. Um, so stacks are the exact opposite. If I put in A, B, C, C will come out, then B will come out, then A. Um, both of them have the following functions. Push E, E stands for an element, so I push in one element. Um, I have peak and I have pop. Um, so a Q, we usually have first, second, third. Um, Q, we kind of represent in a linear fashion horizontally. Stacks, we represent vertically. Um, you have like the head on the top. Um, a nice meme about stacks and Qs. So let's just go over queues again. Order of operations, you insert at the tail, that'd be at the end, you remove from the head. The runtime analysis, inserting is O of 1, um, removing is O of 1, and peaking is O of 1. So all of them are constant time. Um, are there any questions on queues right now? Going once, going twice, none. So we have stacks. Um, as we said before, they kind of represent it vertically. You add elements to the top, and you also remove elements from the top. Runtime is the exact same as queues, so constant time for everything. Um, queues and stacks. So here's the first question. Um, are there any general questions on queues and stacks? I, it should be relatively straightforward. Good. So first question, if I have uh, this sequence of instructions, if it's a queue, what does it pop out? And if it's a stack, what does it pop out? Um, so I'll give you guys like one minute each. It's just five. 10 instructions. And can you guys just like give me a visual cue when you guys have finished? So maybe like a raise your hand or something so I can get a general feel when you guys have, are done. Yeah, putting your thumb up works too. Okay, so I'll take it from the laughter that some of you guys have gotten the queue in the stack, um, so I'll start. Does anybody want more time, or should I go over it? Okay, I'll take that as a go over it. Um, so we have a queue, this sequence of events. Um, so I push an S, my queue has one element. I pop it out, I have an S. I push in an A, pop it out. So far, nothing fancy. 
So now I have two pushes, push in an N. Now I push in a T, so the T comes after the N. When I pop it out, because it's a Q, I pop it out from the, the left side. So I have an N, put in an A, pop, pop. So using the sequence of events, I get Santa. Uh, any questions on the Q? Coolio. Um, now, stack, I have the exact same sequence of events, but you'll see um, there is a difference between stacks and queues. So push in an S, pop it out, push in an A, pop it out, push in an N, push in a T, it's vertical, so we push it on the top. When we pop, we pop it out from the top, push in an A, pop, pop, you have Satan. Um, so, ha ha ha, very funny. Um, I thought it was pretty cool. You get an antigram, fun fact, if you have an anagram and a, that has an antonym, it's called an antigram. So any questions on these? Hopefully not. Coolio, I guess. If you guys have questions, feel free to ask. Oops. Okay. Rapid fire. Um, so choose between impl implementing a solution using a queue or a stack. Um, reversing a string, I'm gonna give you guys, let's say, 30 seconds. Um, if you guys want more time, let me know. But talk to your neighbors and decide what you would want. Okay, so can I get a raise of hands of who thinks it's a queue? No one's raising their hand. How about a stack? Okay, good. So it's a stack, why? Because I can just put in each character one by one and then um, I just pop it out and I get it in the reverse ordering. So now second question, storing the last four characters typed. I'll give you guys another 30 seconds, talk about this with your neighbors. Um, just for reference, you can imagine every character like just being given to you as a single element. Do you guys want more time or should, should I go over the answer? Raise your hand if you need more time. Okay, I'll go over the answer. So if you want to store the last four characters, um, you can use a queue. Um, so imagine I am typing in A, B, C, D, E, F, G, H, I, J, K, the entire alphabet. Or if I, let's, let's have more fun, let's say I do it backwards, Z, Y, X, W, V, U, T, S, R, Q, P, O, N, M, and so on. Um, I put in Z, I put in Y, I put in X, I put in <coughs> W. When I put in U, right, um, I want to get rid of the last character that was typed, so I can just get rid of Z, right? Um, so basically, once I reach my capacity of four, every time I insert a new element, all I need to do is pop out the last one. And that's a way for you to store the last four characters typed. Next question, the back function in a browser. So I'll give you guys another 30 seconds for this one. Do you guys want more time? Yeah, we have a question. 
Wait, wait. Could you guys all quiet down a bit? I can't hear the question. Yep. OK. Yeah, so just to repeat the question, um, the question is, what happens if I'm typing more than four characters? Specifically, let's say, what happens if I'm typing 10 characters? Right? Um, so once I have reached my capacity of four, what I can do is when I insert a new element, I can pop out just, just the last one, right? So let's say I have A, B, C, D. When I insert E to my Q, I can just say pop. And if I pop, I get rid of the first element that was inserted, which was A, right? So now in my Q, I only have B, C, D, and E. So, so basically, once you reach capacity, what you want to do is you want to insert your new one and pop out your last one. And that's why you use a Q. Um, so I'm going to go back function in browser. Um, can we get a shout out for queues? Can we get a shout out for stack? Oh, come on, let's get a better shout out. Ah, oh, fine, you guys are sleepy. So basically, yeah, a stack. Um, all right, wait, can you guys quiet down a bit? Thank you. Um, it's a stack because every, excuse moi, por favor. All right, can we keep it quiet for a bit? Thank you. Um, so we use a stack because every time I add in or basically click a new link, I, what I can do is I can add that web page to my, um, to my stack. And if I click the back, all I need to do is pop out the last element in the stack. So a stack works in this case because it stores essentially the most recent element. And when I, when I click the back button, what I want to do is I want to go to the most recent element that I was just at. So that's why we have a stack. Um, so for the last rapid fire question, what happens if I want to do the backward and forward function? And now you guys can talk for a bit. I'll give you guys one minute. This one's a little more complicated. OK, so I'm going to go over the answer. The answer is two stacks. Um, so the question is, why is two stacks? I think this one's a little more complicated one. So we kind of have it right there. Um, it says undo and redo. It should actually say just backwards and forwards. My apologies for that. Um, so we use two stacks, um, one for each function. Um, so as we say there, if we do a new action, you put it into um, B. Well, let's say that's the back stack. Um, that way, if I want to click back, um, all I do is I pop out that element. Um, if forward is clicked, what I can do is I can add the current page um, to B and pop from F. Um, so, so you have it right here. And if, it's a, if I visit a new page, I clear F. Are there any questions on this one? Yeah? Uh, could you repeat the question? Um, so the question is, can we use a double-ended queue for this? What do you think? Um, yeah, you could. Right? Uh, okay. Um, good transition, though. DQs. Um, so what's a DQ? First, first in, um, not sure when it's coming out. Ha ha. Can I get a slight laugh? OK, thank you. Um, so essentially, um, it supports insertion and removal at both ends. Um, so you can add first, add last, remove first, remove last. Um, so in most 61B tests I actually have not seen DQs. Usually we stick with stacks and queues. Um, that said, it's still nice to know what a DQ is in case it pops up. Um, one example use case might be um, when you have a line and people can leave at the front if they get served. Also, they can leave at the back if they just get tired of waiting. Um, so are there any questions on stacks, queues, and DQs? Um, if not, we're going to be going into graphs. OK, I'll take that as no questions. Um, so we're going to do graphs part one, it's kind of the vanilla um, graph traversal techniques. So the first one is breadth first search, um, BFS for short. Um, the second one is DFS, um, or depth first search. Um, so breadth first search basically visits all 
so you have a starting node and you visit all the neighboring nodes first and then kind of the second degree neighbors and so on. Um, you use it um, and you implement it using a queue. DFS, on the other hand, um, you implement using recursion or a stack. We have kind of three main types of DFS um, traversal or you, more specifically the printing of the order. We have post order, pre order, in order, um, and I included out of order as a, another bad joke. Uh -huh. Okay, what's the question? How would an in order graph traversal work? Um, good, so you actually beat me to one of my slides, so we'll get back to that question later on. Okay. Um, so pre order and post order, this is the DFS pseudocode, or this is a DFS pseudocode, right? Um, if, it's, if it's a valid node, um, if it's not a valid node, basically if it's a null node return, um, else go to your left neighbor and go to your right neighbor and return. Um, so specifically, um, in this case, what do we assume every node has? H how many children does every node have in this pseudocode? Two, right? Um, and specifically a left and a right. Um, so here's some questions. Where do our print statements go? Pre-order, in order, post of order, and out of order again. Sorry, I kept my bad jokes. Um, so pre-order, I'll give you guys, let's say, 20 seconds for each one. So just to be clear, the question is, I have kind of three spaces. Um, I think I have my mouse, good. I have a space here, a space here, and a space here, and I'm gonna tell you, pre-order print, oops. Okay, pre-order print goes here. Okay, so where does in-order and post-order go? Um, so I'll give you guys roughly 30 seconds for that. Okay, so I'll just go over the solution. So as I mentioned, pre-orders in the very beginning, so that's where you'd put your print statement. In order, you'd put it in between, and post-order, you'd put it at the end. Um, so there's actually, there's a glaring error in our code. Um, so just to give you guys a hint, um, this DFS pseudocode would only work for a tree with directed edges. Um, so can you guys try thinking for, let's say another 30 seconds um, on what the error is and how you would fix it. Okay, so does anybody want to tell me what's wrong with this code? Any brave volunteers? Um, so we have one suggestion that we're assuming right now that all the edges are pointing outwards. Um, that's, on, that's the right idea, but there's something a little more concrete. There's something that I'm not doing specifically. Exactly, so the, so the error right here is we're not checking if something's visited. So if I have a cycle, I'll just DFS infinitely forever. Um, so a key note is I wanna have some way of checking how I visited a node or not, um, and if so, I can just terminate early. So are there any questions on pre-order, post-order, and in-order? Okay, um, now I'll go back to the question. Um, I got a question before, um, the guy in the red Roughly right there, hey. Um, so your question was, how do I do in order on a graph? Um, if you look here, we do in order because we, we know we have exactly two children. So I can put my print statement in between my two children. In a graph, I'm not sure how many children I have, right? I could have an array list of children. So in reality, there's no such thing as an in order traversal of a graph um, or a graph with more than two children. 
Um, so if there are not any questions, I will go to a BFS example. Um, I'll, I think I'll give you guys like two minutes, one minute to just go through it. Assume you start at A um, and then just do the BFS on this. So does anyone want more time on this, or should I just go through the solution? Go through the solution? Yeah? Getting a few nods, OK. Um, so right now, I, as we said, we start at A. So I have A in my queue. Um, so I visit A. Um, note how I have a visited. So that's kind of a Boolean saying I, I, I visited A so far. I put in BCD. Um, in this case, I, I guess I forgot to say it, tell up front, assume you um, break ties alphabetically. So that's why you put in B, C, D. Um, we visit the first thing on the queue, we visit B. Um, B is also connected to E, so we put in E. Note how we also put in C. So B is connected to both C and E, and technically we have not, con we have not seen C. So in, the, in this case, Q has, the queue has C twice, okay? Um, does that make sense to everybody why we put in C? Okay, good. Or right, no? Then no, it doesn't? Okay, so let's go back. So right now we have visited only has A, right? So we just visited A, now I'm going to visit B, right? I visit B, and now the question is what do I put in my queue? So right now we said we're adding C and E. The question is why are we adding C? Well, we never, we have not visited C before. I have no idea if I'm going to visit C, if C is in the queue, if C is not in the queue. So regardless, because I have, I, because C is not visited, I need to add it back in the queue. So that's why you have C in twice. Does that make sense? No, C is just in the queue, yeah. Okay, so once I have C in, so now I pop out the first C that's initially there, um, so I visit C, I add in just F because that's the only uh, child. I visit D, so this is a relatively mechanical process. Note how I am adding in C and F again. Um, sorry, not C, I'm, I'm adding in just F again. Right, so here, oh, technically that's off. I should not be adding C, my bad. Um, so now we visit E, so note how we skip the C because C was already visited. Um, so I just skip C, go straight to E. Um, with E, I add in G. Um, now I visit F. I skip C and F, and then I go to G. Um, so are there any questions on BFS? OK, if there are no questions, we'll go to DFS. So let's do the exact same thing. DFS starting on A, um, break ties alphabetically. I'll give you guys another one or two minutes to work on this.
Okay, do you guys need any more time? Can you guys raise your hand if you guys need time? Nope, so I'll be going over the answer. So we start off with A. Um, so that's why we put it into our stack. The stack right now only has A. So I visit A, I put in B, C, D. Um, we have A that's put into our visited set. Um, so the question is how do you know which order to add it? Um, in general, just break ties alphabetically. Um, Yes, um, so that's a good question. Why is it not DCB? Um, the logic being, if I put it in BCD, um, technically it's a stack, so it reverses the order. Um, in this case, I just assume for kind of ease that I just it, it ends up being BCD. So that that's a good question. So note, in this case, that means we are adding in our children in reverse order. So I put in D first, then C first, and then B. Okay, not B first, then C, then D. So that's a good catch. Um, any other questions? Um, do you guys need to redo some of your DFS? Um, okay, so why don't I guys, why don't I give you guys another um, like one minute? So just just to make it clear, we are assuming that we are putting in our children in reverse order. Um, so that's why it's B C D and not D C B. Okay, um, so I'm gonna continue. So I have B, C, D. Um, so because of the stack, I pop out B. Um, now I have visited A and B. So B is connected to C and E. So note how I put in C again um, because I haven't visited C. I visit C so I can take that out, put it into my visited set, and C is only connected to F, so I add an F. Um, pop out F. Um, F is not connected to anything, so we don't add anything in. So we have E. E is connected to G, so we put that in. Um, and then likewise, take out G. Now we've already visited C, so I now go to D, um, and we're done. So are there any questions on this DFS? Um, yeah? Uh, which case? When, when I take B out, I add in C and E. Yeah, this this is the clarification I, m I made initially. Yeah. Um, so I think when I when we post it, I'll do a disclaimer up top. Um, any questions? Nope. Yeah. All right, go over it again. So the main question here is, in this case, why did I put in B, C, D? Okay, um, the logic being, well, if I'm gonna put in my children in order, I would put in first B, then C, and then D. So technically, D should be at the top, and B should be at the bottom. Um, so th this is me not being clear in the problem statement. I should have said um, that we are putting it in reverse order just so it ends up being alphabetically nice. Um, but that is that is a good catch. Um, so any other questions? Going once, going twice. Um, so what is topological sort? Um, topological sort is essentially a fancy way of saying we must do some stuff in order. What does order mean? Basically I need to do, in this case, A before B, um, I must visit D and C before F, and so on. 
Um, so these type of relationships are very good and very nice because they can be represented as a graph very easily. Um, one common application could be, let's say I want to plan out my um, Berkeley college career and what classes I want to take. I need to take 61A before I take 61B, 61B before I take 61C, and so on. So you can capture that type of relationship with a graph like this um, and kind of find a topological ordering um, of, um, of the graph. Um, so the natural question then is, how do I find a topological ordering? Um, ends up that the reverse post order is just a topological store, um, is just a topological ordering. So in this graph, for example, A, D, B, E, G, C, F is one such um, topolo topological ordering. Um, note how topological orderings are not unique. Um, I wrote A, D, B, E, G, C, F. I could have easily switched the D and the B, and that would still be a valid topological ordering. So are there any questions on topological ordering? Mm -hmm. Huh? So the question is, um, if there are many such orderings, how do you decide the order? Yeah, um, well, usually for a complex graph, you just run DFS, um, right? Mainly because I want to get um, reversed post order. So what I do is I'd run DFS, I'd get my post order, and I'd just reverse it. Um, so all you need is a such um, one. Any other questions? Okay, runtime of BFS and DFS. Um, so this is just a general way of approaching runtimes on graph traversal problems. Um, first, you want to do how many times we tra traverse each edge. Um, then basically, in this case, we traverse each edge once. Um, what is the cost of each traversal? In this case, um, can someone tell me what I need to do when I traverse an edge? What are the actions um, for either BFS or DFS? I have, what did you say? Yeah, good. So one is you have to mark it as seen. Or, uh, sorry, not, that's actually not true. That's not, not, not yet. So when we traverse an edge, what are we doing when we're traversing an edge? Anybody have some ideas? Mm -hmm. Huh? We are we're signing, or, or more specifically, if you think about it in terms of a stack and a... Um, a queue traversing an edge is essentially I put a element inside my queue or inside a stack, right? Um, so, so that's why in this case it kind of involves an insert. Um, so inserts are cost of one. Um, I think when you guys do Dijkstra's, you'll end up seeing an insert is not a cost of one, right? Um, now the next thing we need to do is how many times do we visit each node? Um, in this case, we only visit once. That's why we have our set. Um, or some type of way to say, okay, I visited a node. Um, cost per node is, so what does visiting a node entail? <coughs> visiting, a, the, visiting a node entails a pop, right? So I, I, I pop something out from the stack or the queue, um, and that's how I get my O of one. Um, so then if you just add them up, you have E edges, cost of one, plus V vertices, cost of one. You get a total runtime of O of V plus E. Um, I think the main takeaway is not necessarily that uh, BFS and DFS is just O of V plus E, but this kind of general mindset of approaching a graph traversal problem, because if they give you a different type of graph traversal problem, you kind of want to approach the runtime in some mindset like this. Um, so are there any questions? Oh, sorry, here. Um, so the question is, wouldn't the cost of each traversal be, what exactly? Um, would be dependent on how many, o how many nodes I need to add on each traversal. Um, basically, in other words, the question I think is, it's based on how many children that node has? Yeah. Okay. Um, so to be precise, I, I think here, the, maybe the confusing terminology is traverse and edge. So by traverse an edge, essentially, let's imagine BFS, I traverse an edge, quote unquote, by adding the children into the queue, right? I have not technically traversed it, but it's more like I, I will traverse the edge, right? Um, so in that case, 
um, it's O of one. Um, any other questions? Um, okay, I have a few rapid fire ones. You guys, oh, oops. Um, so before that, um, what we like and what we not like about BFS and DFS, um, the main thing we like is a very fast runtime. It's very hard to beat O of E plus V because that's linear time. Um, one concern though, it is it does not take into account edge weights. Um, so in general, we use it in the following, when there's no edge weights or we don't care for them, or another way, um, or another thing they're useful for is quickly checking if two nodes are connected or not. Um, so rapid fire, getting all the nodes within, uh, that can be reached within two edges, it should say, of a starting node. Um, so if you guys can take, let's say, 30 seconds, talk this over with a neighbor. Oh, sorry, the question is supposed to ask, are you guys gonna use BFS or DFS? Okay, um, so for every bullet point, just try thinking BFS or DFS. Okay, so how many of you guys think it's BFS? Can you guys raise your hand? Um, how many guys think it's DFS? Yeah, I agree, I think it's DFS too. Um, so this is kind of a trick one. Um, both BFS and DFS work. It's basically, how do you implement it? Um, so I think most people said BFS because that's quote unquote the slightly more, I'm gonna use air quotes, intuitive or basically kind of more mechanical approach because um, BFS naturally visits um, all the nodes kind of by how far they are edges wise. Um, but you can use DFS um, because you can short circuit it once it's gone a certain amount of depth. So if you imagine having a little extra counter, you can just count uh, like zero, one, two, and then at two you don't need to visit any neighbors. Um, so are there any questions on how BFS and DFS work in this case? Okay, next question. Um, we have a game and to do a level we must finish some prerequisite levels. Uh, we want to find an ordering of levels to play. Um, so another 30 seconds for this one. So does anyone have any ideas on how to approach it? Can I get some shout outs? We have one person saying DFS. I'm hearing some other stuff. Can someone say it louder? Okay, topological ordering. Um, so that's the main idea. We must find a topological ordering. Now the question is how do I find a topological ordering? Um, reverse post to order. Um, so does anyone have a question on why we want to find the topological ordering? Nope, okay, so we'll go to the last one. Um, we want to check if node A is connected to node B and we think that B is close to A beforehand. Uh, we have a question? Um, so we basically, we want to check if node A is connected to node B and we think that the node B is close to A beforehand. Close as in number of edges. Um, so what problem does this look kind of like? This one kind of looks like some other problem we just did. 
It, this one is basically kind of the first problem reworded. Um, so instead of saying, it, like, just check all the nodes within two, um, it, it's slightly different. Um, note, however, in this case, BFS might be better. Um, because let's say it's close, quote unquote, but we're not sure how close it is. So the natural question is, in the first case, we say terminate after two edges. Um, but if I'm using DFS, how many edges do I terminate? Um, so in that sense, you want to use BFS because BFS naturally goes in order. Um, so you visit all the first, all the second, and all the third. So are there any questions on these? Yep. For which one? Okay. So I think the question is um, right now for this um, for the second bullet point we have um, it says reverse order reverse post order DFS and the question is was the very first example we did to be precise was this like what order this was in? Um, so, can someone tell me what order this DFS is in? So, what is, is this a pre-order, post-order, or in-order, quote-unquote, DFS? First of all, can this be an in-order DFS? Not really. More than that, the reason why I didn't state an ordering is because when you do post-order and pre-order, that's specifically kind of related to the print statements, or kind of when you, quote-unquote, track it, right? So in this case, we are not having a explicit print statement. So the kind of implicit print statement is at the very beginning. So that's why when we say visited A, B, C, F, that's our implicit ordering. So if, if it had to be classified as something, we could classify this as pre-order. Okay, so if there are no questions about BFS, DFS, stacks, oh, one question. Okay, so the specific um, question is for the first bullet point, what exactly do you mean by a counter? Um, so for DFS, can someone tell me what the counter would be used for? Um, just to be clear, um, first bullet point, I say keep a counter. So if I did my DFS solution, what would the counter keep track of? Um, we have one suggestion for how many nodes we've seen so far. We're talking about DFS. Does anybody else have a suggestion? What would our counter be? Huh? Your depth? Anybody else have any suggestions? Um, so yeah, the correct answer is for our first one, if you're using DFS depth for search, you would use um, your counter to track the depth. So what we would do is we would add another variable, let's say, um, depth. So it would start off as, let's say, zero when I'm at my starting node. When I go to his children, I increment it by one, so I'd have one. Um, then I would visit all the children. Now the children would have an incremented count of two. Um, and then I, all I need is a little st if statement that says, if my counter is equal to two, stop, because that means I'm two away. Um, so are there any, yep? For the second, uh, the, the second, for this one? Mm -hmm. What's the question? Oh, whoops. Will DFS pre-order work? Um, do we think DFS pre-order will work for the second one? Um, so, th so the answer is no, because we are specifically looking for topological ordering. Um, and topological ordering will not give me, um, and topological ordering is only found doing reverse post order. So pre-order will not work. Um, so the question is, what do we use pre-order for? Um, you can use pre-order to, for example, just to just find a path from A to B. Um, so if I ha imagine having a graph, I could just say I went from A to B to C to D and I'm, I'm happy. Um, so, so that's what you'd use pre-order for. Mm -hmm. What order is DFS? Uh, so the question is what order is DFS just by itself? 
Um, so as mentioned before, the post-order, pre-order, and in-order is related to the print statements, right? We had, that, we had that slide in the very beginning about where the print statements is, or is in the code. Um, so DFS by itself doesn't really have an ordering. DFS by itself is just a way to traverse nodes. Now the question is, pre-order and post-order specifically say, when do I print out or when do I keep track of? Um, so they're, they're a way of ordering your nodes. Um, so if we had to define it as something, we could say regular DFS is most similar to pre-ordering um, pre because that's the ordering in which we visit the nodes initially. So what do you mean by post-order DFS? So post-order DFS means run DFS, um, get the post-ordering, right? Is that the question? How do you get the post-ordering if you run DFS? Okay, so the question is how do you get the um, post-ordering using the DFS? Um, I think that's better explained in the slide. I can talk to you later. So th that'll take a little more time than what we have right now. Um, so are there any more questions on this? Nope, if not, I will hand it over to, what's your name? Joe? Oh, yes. I forgot your name. All right, here you go. I, just, I just found it easy to do blood blood on my day. What? It's easier without the agent. Oh, okay. I think I'll try it. Hello? Okay. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Joe. Uh, I'll be covering the second half of graph theory stuff. Um, I tend to kind of like rush through slides whenever I present, so please ask me any questions you have. Like, I promise I'll think that they're good questions, so anything's fine. Um, so first we're gonna start off talking about Dijkstra's, uh, which is one of like the most, uh, I would say like classic graph theory algorithms. Um, and Dijkstra's is mainly concerned with finding the shortest path from some starting vertex S to all other vertices in the graph. Um, it's also known as uniform cost search, or UCS. I've seen that term thrown around a little bit, so that might be good to know. And then um, it finds us the shortest paths tree, um, which essentially just means the like uh, collection of all of the shortest paths for any given uh, graph from S to all of the vertices. Um, and it does this by utilizing a min PQ to visit unvisited vertices in increasing path order, uh, or, in pet, or for increasing path cost, rather. And um, it is non-optimal if we have negative edge weights, which means that it could possibly return the incorrect shortest path if we have some negative edges in the graph. Um, and this reasoning is simply just because, like, uh, like we said before, uh, if we have negative edges in the graph, adding an edge to a path could decrease its cost, um, which means the algorithm would no longer work. As far as runtime, um, it's essentially just visiting each vertice, uh, uh, each vertex, and going through each edge, and then doing the min PQ operations on at most uh, like every edge. Um, so in the end, we end up with theta v plus e log v. Um, are there any like general questions about Dijkstra's or what I've covered so far? Yeah. From the the two runtimes? Yeah. Um, so we can start by saying that like we have v plus e plus e log v, um, and then e log v will dominate e simply because like log v is always going to be yeah. Um, so then we can just remove e from that. Are there any more questions? Okay. Um, so then I'll give you guys about five minutes, but we want to do Dijkstra's on this graph starting from S and then return the shortest paths tree. Oh, and as a clarification, uh, there's only one tie in this graph and it's going to be between B and C and just break it by going to C first.
All right. So let's get started with it. Um, so basically, the like zeroth step of Dijkstra's is just to add the like. Uh, the starting node with priority uh, zero. So we're going to add S with priority zero, um, update its cost in the uh, table that we're keeping, and then DQ from the priority queue. So we're going to pop S from the priority queue and mark it as visited, uh, and then on queue any of its unvisited neighbors, which in this case are both B and C. Um, so both of those are going to go in the priority queue, and then we update their cost and previous values in the table. Um, and now we're going to pop from the priority queue again. Uh, so I mentioned this earlier, but we're going to break ties by just going to C first. Um, so we're going to mark C as visited. And now uh, uh, we're going to on-queue all the neighbors of C that have not been visited, which are just A. Um, so A will go in the priority queue with priority four. Um, and then again, we're going to pop from the priority queue. So we're going to pop B this time. And then on queue, uh, so this time uh, the only unvisited, so there are no like, the only unvisited neighbor of B is A. So we're going to check the priority queue and see if uh, we can either insert A or update A's value. So in this case, since going through B gives us a path cost of three, we're going to update the value of uh, A in the priority queue to three. And as well, that means we both update its total path cost as well as its previous pointer. Um, so now we're going to dequeue A and uh, on queue its neighbors, which are just G. Uh, and then we can dequeue G and we're done. Uh, so are there any questions about how I went through all of this? I kind of did it all at once, so. Okay, great. Um, so then once we have this, uh, we can say, we can find any of the shortest paths by just simply following the previous pointers. Um, so we have the previous path, uh, like we have the four paths uh, that I've listed below, and having the edges of those paths added together, we can say that the shortest paths tree is simply just the whole graph minus C to A. Um, and so since we popped A from the queue after visiting it from B, it means that C to A is not in the shortest paths tree. Are there any questions about how I got this tree structure? Yes. Um, so I never actually went, like, I never traversed from C to A. Um, all you do whenever you go, like, at this point, whenever we popped C from the queue, we added its neighbors to the priority queue, right, which is just A, but we never, like, visit a node until we pop it from the priority queue. And, and when, you, when you add the C neighbors, you also update cost? Yeah, that's when you update cost. So the reason why, like, the cost of A ends up being three is because we saw it again from a different Okay, so are there any additional questions about Dijkstra's? Okay, so then here's Dijkstra's cooler big brother, uh, A star. So most of the time whenever we have like uh, graph questions, we really only care about the shortest path from S to some like goal node, right? Like you wanna know the fastest way to get from Berkeley to Los Angeles or something like that. A star is simply an optimization on Dijkstra's in two different ways. Um, one is that you break once you dequeue G, implying that you found the uh, shortest path to G, and you make an optimization to visit nodes closer to G first. So the way we do that is to first define a heuristic function H, uh, which we use to estimate a node's distance to G. So now the priority in the min PQ for some node is the path cost to get from S to that node, plus the heuristic value at that node. So say we DQ X and add its neighbor Y to the priority queue. Y's priority is now going to be the path cost from S to Y plus the heuristic at Y. Um, and a way to think about this is also like it's kind of recursive in the way that you can simply subtract uh, X's heuristic from its priority and that gives you the, the path cost from S to X and then you add the edge cost from X to Y and then the heuristic of Y. So, um, if anyone has any questions about like that equation in particular, um, I can answer that once I'm kind of like done with my section, but it's a little bit like on the fringe of out of scope. But yeah, it's a good way to think about it. So are there, actually initially, are there any questions about A star? Or heuristic functions? Okay, 
So same thing, but now we're doing A star. Um, yeah, so essentially the biggest difference here is just what we add to the priority queue. Everything else is going to essentially be uh, the same. So I'll give you just a couple minutes with this one. Yeah. Sorry. Oh, sorry, the target node here is G. Um, mm -hmm. It's the other way around. Mm. Yeah. Or actually, let me think about, actually talk to me about that after because, yeah, I forgot the exact equation for that. Actually, yeah, you're right. So that should have been a four, but it actually doesn't change the answer for this. The heuristic of A should have been a four. OK, so let's get started. So again, the zero step is just to add S, um, but this time it's added with its own heuristic value. So it gets added with four. Um, we update its cost to just be zero, and then pop it from the queue, mark it as visited. And so now, whenever we add the neighbors B and C, they're going to be added with uh, two plus the heuristic at uh, B, which is four in total, and then eight for C. Um, so now we're just going to go straight to B, right? We don't have to do any tie breaking. Um, so we pop B from the priority queue, and then add its neighbors, which are just A, with uh, priority four. Uh, if I had done this, let me think, four. if I had done this correctly with H being four at A, then we would have A with seven as priority. But in this case, it would be four. Um, so popping A from the queue, we now add G with priority seven, and then pop G from the queue. So now we can say we actually can just finish right here because we popped G from the priority queue. Um, so we can go ahead and terminate early. So Notice that in the end, we still found the same path to G as Dijkstra's did, and that was because our heuristic was relatively accurate and admissible. Um, and as well, uh, we never expanded C, so we did save on runtime in some way. Um, and this is way more obvious in larger graphs, uh, but for the sake of you know, being able to do a small example, uh, we kept it pretty small. But imagine uh, a scenario in which C has like a ton of, like, uh, edges exiting it, right? We would never even have to look at any of those edges. So are there any like additional questions about A star? Yeah. Sorry. 
Um, so the cost in the table, the question was why are we keeping track of just the path cost in the, in the table, right? Um, so the reason why we're keeping track of the cost over there on the right is simply just to like keep track of the actual like absolute path cost. It, uh, it doesn't represent like what we're actually keeping track of in the priority queue. Um, so that's just for our use later. And it also makes it easier to like uh, add to the priority queue since we are constantly keeping track of the path cost as we move on. Yeah. Okay. So uh, here we're going back to Dijkstra's for just a second and uh, we're going to ask some true or false questions. So uh, the first one is if some edge weights are negative, the shortest paths tree S can be obtained by adding a constant K to every edge weight large enough to make all edge weights positive and running Dijkstra's on this new graph. Uh, so we're wondering if that is a true statement or if that is false. And then as well, we also have number two being let P be the shortest path from some vertex S to some other vertex T. If the edge weights of each edge are squared, then P remains the shortest path from S to T. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and give you guys, I'd say, like two or three minutes for the first one, and then we'll go over it and then move on to the second one. All right, how many people think the first one is true? Raise your hand if you think the first one is true. No, no one? All right, uh, so then raise your hand if you think the first one is false. Okay, a lot more votes, not many votes though. Uh, so the first one is actually going to be false. So the reason why, uh, I did a counter example but we can discuss like why in more depth later. Um, Basically consider a graph where we have three edges, or three nodes, all with edges uh, to each other. So we have edges A to B, A to C, and B to C, all with weight negative one. So the shortest path from A to C is going to be of weight negative two, right, going through B. Um, if you add uh, enough, if you add with K equals two to make all of them positive, now the shortest path becomes um, just going straight to C with edge weight one, right? So it actually will change the shortest path from some node to some other node, meaning Dijkstra's will not return the correct path. Are there any questions about why that is? Okay, so then moving on to the second one, uh, we'll take another two or three minutes. Are there any, does anyone need any clarifications about what it means by like, by squaring each of the edges or, or what the problem is asking? Okay. Yeah. 
Yeah, this is assuming that like uh, you found the shortest path like in a standard graph. So yeah, positive edge weights originally. Yeah. Uh, I can after. I don't know how I would like draw. It. Can I like? Yeah, we have chalk, but yeah, probably afterwards would be better. Like it would show up way better. I don't know if like we can try. You want to draw it right now? Okay. Yeah, we can we can cover that after for sure. Yeah. Um Uh yeah, we're going to cover that later, but yeah, you're you're correct. Um, so which one, like, are, you're saying before we square everything, right? Like, um, sure, so you could, you could have, like, possibly negative edge weights there, but we're asking for, like, in any case, right? Like, you've just found a shortest path from S to T. Is there, like... Uh... A valid counterexample, then, yeah, that would. Um, yeah. Okay, so how many people think the second one is true? No, okay, so most false, all right. So it is going to be false, and again, we can consider uh, a graph where there are two paths from S to some vertex V, um, one consisting of three one-cost edges and another consisting of a single two-cost edge. Initially, the latter path is shorter, just being edge cost two, um, but after we square the weight of each edge, the first path is still cost three, and the second path becomes cost four. Uh, so basically this just means that like if we have two paths with like a different number of edges, it's going to change uh, the ordering of which paths are uh, less costly. Okay, uh, and then one last Dijkstra's question before we move on. Um, so we did mention that Dijkstra's fails for uh, uh, negative edge weights. Um, but we're concerned with a graph where the negative edge weights are only incident to S. Um, and so I think we already talked about this a bit, but, um, or it was brought up earlier, but I'm actually just going to skip uh, giving you guys time to work on this and just kind of spoil it. So this is actually kind of a trick question. Um, Dijkstra's will still work here. And the reasoning is that Dijkstra's fails with negative edge weights because whenever we pop from the min PQ, we're basically saying, like, we know that we found the minimum uh, cost way to get to an edge, or to get to a vertex. Um, so that will fail if there are some negative edge weights in the graph. So for example, for the graph on the left, um, we are going to find three through the top path first, right? If we're just popping from the priority queue in like uh, order of um, increasing uh, path weights. But the real shortest way to get to three is through four, right? Because that would end up being uh, path weight one. However, on the right side here, um, we aren't ever going to like decrease a path once we've started on it. So. Uh, Right, the first thing we would pop would be one, right? And then we can know that going from one to two is going to be uh, negative one cost. So, um, yeah, if there are any further questions on that, we can ask that afterwards, or you can, we can cover that afterwards for sure. Um, but I'm going to go ahead and move on to, uh, actually, I'm going to hand it off to Tapan for just a second to talk about uh, path compression. Uh, okay. Okay, um, so we're going to talk about weighted quick union and path compression really quick, and then we give it back to Joe. Uh, so first thing, right? So what is weighted quick union? Uh, so weighted quick union uh, is an efficient way to find out if two nodes are a part of the same set. Um, let's see. Basically, we use this for minimal spanning trees. We'll talk about this in a few slides. Um, but I guess the biggest thing right here, right? So we use an identifier for each set. So say if we have two sets, we have an identifier for each set. 
And we use this identifier to make sure that two items are within the same set or not. So within weighted quick union, we have two methods. Uh, we, uh, we have find and union. So find tells us which set the uh, node is in, and it returns the, the identifier. And uh, union combines two nodes together uh, and has one identifier point to the other. Uh, we'll talk about this on the next slide more. Uh, but yes, we'll talk about path compression. So what is path compression? So path compression is a way to uh, make way to quick union more uh, efficient. So this generally occurs when we call finder union. Um, so if you see this example here, right? So this is uh, before we apply path compression, and then this is after. So if you notice, uh, this makes, why do we do path compression? And we said that uh, we, you, we do uh, path compression to make way to quick union more efficient. So to look at why this right here, uh, where all one through six are pointed to zero directly, is more, it's like the reason that this is more efficient than this is because if you look at nodes five and six here, right? So if we look at nodes five and six, five and six have to go to four, to two, and then to zero if we want to find the identifier. So in this case, zero is the identifier. So this takes three uh, iterations of calling the parent to find the identifier of our set. And yes, so yeah, so this is more efficient because we call uh, less operations to find the identifier. Um, but yeah, I think that's it. I'm gonna give it back to Joe. I'm back, all right. So uh, moving from path compression, uh, Tapan mentioned that the main reason why we have path compression is to like speed up uh, a lot of uh, run times which require cycle detection. And so we're going to be talking about that with minimum spanning trees. Um, so minimum spanning trees are essentially a problem in which we are looking for n minus one edges in a graph with the minimum total edge weight. Uh, and essentially that translates to finding the easiest way to create a fully connected graph. Um, so some problems like that are, you know, the classic example is linking cities by telephone wire. So we want each city to have a connection to every other city in like our, you know, kingdom or whatever or, you know, state. But telephone wire costs money, right? So we can represent our edges as our wires and edge weight as the cost of laying that wire. And finding the MST of our graph of cities is essentially the same as finding the cheapest way to connect all cities by telephone wire. All right, so one thing that w is important to talk about when you talk about MSTs is the cut property. Um, so a cut of some graph is a separation of its vertices into two disjoint sets. Um, and the claim is that the min weight edge between any two cuts in a graph has to be in an MST. Um, so the proof of that is suppose we've constructed an MST in which across one of the cuts, uh, we have chosen an edge that is not, or rather we have not chosen the min, minimum weight edge. Um, since we have to have a connected graph, that implies that we have to have chosen some other edge, uh, which was not E, which we can call E prime. Um, and if you replace E prime with E, it gives, you a total, it gives you a smaller total weight of the tree, which means that we didn't have an MST to begin with. Right? So that means that's a contradiction which means that we have to have chosen at least E, right? We can have more than E, but we need to uh, include E across uh, that cut. Are there any questions about like this property or how I proved it or how you know it was proved by someone else? All right, so Prims takes advantage of the cut property, property and iteratively expands the cut until it includes every single vertex. Um, and at each iteration, it chooses the minimum edge incident to the current cut which works because of the cut property and expands the cut through this edge. Um, so it essentially does something very similar to Dijkstra's in which we would start at some vertex, say maybe A here, and then add um, the edges to B and to C and then choose the minimum of the two. Um, and then we expand our search to now include the edges going out of B. Um, so if you have non-unique edge weights, prims may find different MSTs depending on where you start. So for example, uh, in this graph, if you start at A or at D, like it depends on how you uh, break ties here, but you could end up with a different MST, right? And there are several MST, MSTs here. Um, the runtime for that is simply uh, similar to the runtime for Dijkstra's, which is doing uh, E uh, min PQ ops, um, which all take log V time. Right? 
are there any questions about that? Yeah. Yes, so prims will always have a starting location. So here we could run prims from either A, B, C, or D. Right? It's totally up to us. But it will always find an MST no matter where you start. Okay, so let's visualize prims. Uh, so, yeah. So um, you can get different MSTs if you have uh, non-unique edge weights. So for example here, um, like if you basically, if you have multiple MSTs, right? Uh, so for example here, it depends on how we're going to break ties, but starting uh, prims at A or prims at D could potentially give us different uh, MSTs in the end. So on this graph, if we start prims from A, the first thing that we're going to do is set the cut up to B between A and every other vertex, um, and then choose the minimum edge across that cut. So the edge here that we would choose is just four, and then we expand the cut through B. So this is what that looks like. Right, so now we include all of the edges uh, going out of A or B, right, and we choose the minimum there. So we're going to choose uh, the one weight edge between B and D, and then expand the cut to now include D. So notice that now we're no longer considering the edge between A and D because A is no longer, um, uh, that, that edge is no longer between the two cuts that we have set up. Um, so now we choose the minimum weight edge here, which is D to C, right? And then move our cut appropriately. And finally, choose the minimum edge here, which gives us uh, this tree in the end. Uh, and you can go back and kind of just look at the graph and see that this is the minimum possible tree that we could have, right? Uh, are there any questions about how uh, prims works or how we found this tree in the end? Okay. So then alternatively, Kruskal's is the other um, MST algorithm that we have. And Kruskal's takes advantage of the fact that for any tree, there are going to be n minus one edges. So it says we're gonna simply sort the edges by their weight which takes E log E time, right? Now you know why it takes E log E time after going through sorting. Um, and we iteratively pick edges that won't form a cycle until we have N minus one edges. Um, and so this is where path compression comes in because now we can detect cycles in E log star E time, um, which is essentially just E. You can remember it as just being linear because it's basically the same thing. Um, and the proof of optimality here is a lot trickier um, and you don't need to worry about it, but if you're curious, uh, you can check it out. Uh, the link is in the slide. So, Kruskal's will always produce the same MST, assuming uh, the same sort and weighted quick union tie breaking. So, as long as the sort will give you the same ordering of elements, and as long as nothing weird happens in the weighted quick union, uh, Kruskal's will always operate the same, so it will always give you the same MST. Yeah. For sorting? For, oh, so this is uh, E log star E. So um, that's basically just the uh, cycle detecting, like the weighted quick union, the time for just detecting cycles uh, with E elements in a weighted quick union is E log star E. But you can just remember it as, as E because it's, yeah. Yeah, yeah, essentially. Like log star E is basically constant. Okay. Um, so we're gonna do Kruskal's. Um, but to make it more interesting, because I, uh, this would just like be really boring if you know, we didn't have any cycles in the graph, uh, I'm gonna switch those two edge weights. So you know, just for everyone following along in the slides, this happened, right? Um, so if we take our sorted edges, this is what they look like. Um, and we're just going to start from the top, right? So we're going to add B D, uh, B D to our MST and cross it off, right? And then we're going to uh, ask if CD would form a cycle, and it doesn't. So we're going to add it to the MST. Now we're going to ask, does DE form a cycle, and it doesn't, so we're going to add it. And again, ask, does CE create a cycle? And this time it does, right? So we can't add it to our MST, and we're going to skip it. So then we add AB, and now we have N minus one edges, so we can just quit. So this is uh, what the, the MST that we would get in the end. Yeah. Is the shortest path always in the MST? Um, so which shortest path? So 
So like, you, uh, where where are A and B? Uh, so six eight. So it okay. Make like make A to D five, and then you potentially like don't right because the shortest path would then be A D C, right? But it doesn't matter which of those edges we choose for the MST, right? Um. Essentially, no. Like the MST and shortest paths uh, trees are pretty distinct, um, because in the MST we're really worried about like total uh, cost, but for a shortest path from like A to C, we're only worried about those edges, right? So uh, most of the times they won't coincide. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Um, not exactly. So, uh, so are we talking about like the shortest paths like tree or like the, just a shortest path from like A to C or something? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm, yeah. Um, so the tie breaking, like, no, no, it's not always, it's not only whenever like there's a, there's a tie to be broken. Um, yeah, if you want like more examples of like when it won't be the case, you can definitely like ask after for sure. But I, I would like to be able to like draw it, but we're kind of running out of time. All right. So then uh, here is an MST problem. We're basically given this graph, and we know some of the edge weights, but not all of them. And we're curious as to which of the edges we know for sure belong in the MST. Um, so I'll give you guys like couple minutes and then we'll discuss which edges uh, have to be in the MST. Oh, it's banded? What kind of crackers? I like sourdough. 
I'll try one. All right, let's talk about these. So who has a suggestion as to what they think is like needs to be in any MST? Yeah. Okay, he said BD, why BD? Mm -hmm. So what is the cut that you're uh, taking? Uh, well, we don't know what B to A is, right? At just D and everything else at the end? Uh, yeah, so uh, the comment was, if we take the cut where it's D and then all of the other vertices, the minimum edge leaving D is going to be 1, so we have to take that edge. Um, similarly, if we just ran prims from D, the first edge that we would get is 1, right? Um, any other suggestions? Yeah. Yeah, GH, just because we need a correct connected graph in the end, right? Any others? Okay, uh, why BE? Okay. Yeah, yeah. So, um, yeah. So basically, like the the comment was made that like we could say that B has to be connected to like the right. Like we have to connect these like left and right sides of the graph, right? You could make a cut where it's like A B D and then E C F G H, and the minimum edge across that cut is just the three edge, right? Um, so both of those are by the cut property, and then we can't really make any other significant cuts without. Uh, including some of the ones that we don't know. Uh, so in the end, those are going to be the three that we for sure can say are in the MST. G to H because it connects the graph, B to D because of the cut property, and also B to E because of the cut property. Uh, are there any, yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, Right, we would have to either choose AD or AB. So we would have to make a choice there and we don't know, like it could be that AB is one or it could be that AB is three and that would definitely change which one we chose. Are there any more questions about this question or MSTs? No, okay. I'm gonna hand it off then uh, to Oscar who's gonna do sorting. I was just holding this so that both of these will get it. This is to the quick time thing. Um, you could alternatively just have this like button here, but it like sounds weird. So I hold this, right? Um, you can hold it or you can click it onto your shirt. So the click is the same. for the recording that we're going to be hosting on YouTube is this. So make sure so you just hold this. Um, right now you're blocking it. This is the microphone right here. So make sure
Any right over this?
people have a reverse. Checking for your parents. It was sure you're using and visions and stuff like that. If you have a unique array, you will have a unique array after that stage.
67 as the parent, the subsequent And the first step All right. as the temporary in was like it's
sure. Maintain the S metric in some sort of
So given the three-way partitioning scheme, and given an array like this, we would randomly choose a pivot, right, in the first step. So like, let's say we choose this element as the element we are choosing to pivot from. From there, we would have, you can think of it as like three buckets. An equal to bucket, a greater than bucket, and a less than bucket. And from there, going from each element, then decide what elements they each correspond to. Similarly, And for the four partitioning scheme, you will be given two pointers. And you can think of the pointers as implicitly creating the pivot for us, right? We can think of one pivot as liking elements that are small, and the other one liking elements that are like great enough, right? So like this is our G pivot, this is our L pivot. It would perform a comparison on these two elements, and if it was the case that, like, this one that doesn't like elements that are less than, has an element that is greater than one that's greater than, it would perform a pair of swaps in that scenario. And from there, you continue iterating through the elements until it is the case that they sort of converge to a value. And from there, we know that we have created a partitioning of less than, greater than. So from there, on each of the sublists, we would then perform the procedure on it. Like for example, if we had one here and ten here, <coughs> given this, like our less than pivots would enjoy that, and our greater than pivots would also enjoy that, so then they would just both move on. And if it was the case that we had a 9 here and a 2 here, we would not enjoy that because this is our left one pivot, our greater than pivot would not enjoy this. We would swap the two elements, creating a list like this. And then we would increment this one. The reason why we know that it maintains the sort of sorting is because at each step, when there is a correct sort of partitioning, we need to pivot for it. And once we reach the case that like the two pointers intersect, we know that we're done. All right, so does anyone have any questions? So given this information, we know that
All right, thank you, Oscar. So we are running low on time, so we will be cutting tries and TSE short. Um, but Allison over there has went through the effort of creating these slides for you, and I feel like they are very self-intuitive, like just reading through what a try is. There's examples and animations and whatnot. So all in all, that wraps up our review session. Thank you. Yeah, thank you guys so much for coming. Um, we know that HDN also had the review session from six to nine earlier today, so thank you for choosing CSM. And uh, hopefully you learned something useful today. Good luck studying for your exam, and go Bears. Hi. I had a question earlier about drawing the like graph of negative edge weights. Okay. Um, can you ask Joe? He was in charge of graphs. Um, yeah, sorry.